You're still here. I'm glad. We're looking at chapter 8. It's entitled Fables or Sound Doctrine. You know, in this last session, we talked about persecution. The church was sort of fighting for survival against persecution from without. But it was also, and it always had been, struggling with the problem of purity from within. Persecution from without and purity within, from within. Converts were either from a Jewish background or a Greek or Gentile background. That's not too hard to come to because uh, when you come to those categories, you're either Jewish or you're Gentile. Um, those from the Jewish background, they had a propensity to want to bring Jewish legalism and the law back in and add that to the gospel, which we can't do. We don't want to add works to grace. The Greeks, in particular, wanted to add intellectualism and philosophy to the faith uh, and say it's, it's, it's all this philosophical sort of stuff. The church had to hammer out theological details of the faith, combating both the error and the heresies of, of legalism and sort of an intellectualism or uh, a philosophical bent. And we can always say thank God for heresy because it does force the church to think and to hammer out, okay, so what do we believe on that? Uh, and then, of course, these struggles also force the church to deal with some questions about ecclesiastical or church organizational matters as well. So really briefly, it's not, it doesn't take too long to discuss the, the problem of the Jewish legalism. Um, what they were doing originally, the first Jewish legalizers, uh, uh, they were saying converts to Christianity who were Gentile had to become Jewish and keep the law as a means of salvation. Now, I want to just give a quick footnote here that's very important. Some people today will see a person who has a stricter conscience about something. It could be dancing. It could be drinking. It could be smoking. It could be what movies they watch. And this person says, no, I don't do that. And other people will say, well, you're a legalist. No, that's not legalism. It's only legalism if that person says, you can't watch these movies or drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes if you're going to go to heaven. Now you're adding something to salvation. That's legalism. That's legalism. It could be self-righteousness without being legalism by saying, well, I, I don't watch those movies and you do, so I'm a better Christian than you. That's not right either. But even that's not legalism. Biblical legalism is adding something to the gospel and perverting what salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone is all about. So we clear on that. Very important that we understand that. Paul wrote very extensively. Well, they, the, the first church council in Acts chapter 15 was, what do we do about this Jewish-Gentile issue? And they came up with a decision, and here's where it is. And even though the council said, this is where it's going to be, guess what? The problem didn't go away. That's always true. Passing rules and having a council, it doesn't get rid of problems. It, it addresses them. But it doesn't get rid of them because the problem's in people's hearts. And so it continued all. Paul wrote extensively about this problem uh, to the Galatians, to the, Ro to the Romans, but the problem continued to persist. Uh, the Jewish aspect of this kind of legalism is not so prominent today. There's not a, like, a great big Jewish Gentile problem in the church today. We're far enough removed socially and geographically and historically that that is is not a big deal. But there are still always people who are trying to add works to grace and say that's necessary for salvation. Even, even biblical things. You need to be baptized in water or you're not going to heaven. That, the Bible doesn't say that. You need to be baptized in water because you're saved and going to heaven. Not in order to be saved and go to heaven. So there's, the church still has to wrestle with this problem of legalism. And why is it this? Because man is always trying to figure out something to add to the simple gospel so that he has something to boast in. Yeah, well, you know, I did this and I did that and I did the other. No, no, no. When you get to heaven, if you're, if you're going to heaven, it's because your faith is in Christ. And when you get there, you're not going to be buffing your nails and bragging about anything. Our boast is solely in the Lord. Our salvation is from Him as grace from start to finish. Well, that's a little bit about the legalism problem, but a little bit more about the Greek philosophy problem. There were far more Greeks in the church than there were Gentiles than there were Jews after a while. So Greek philosophy posed an even greater uh, threat to purity. I stop and think there's a lot more baggage that comes from the Greek religions and the Greek philosophy that needs to be dealt with in order to become a Christian than from the Jews, because if a Jewish person understands their heritage, they realize, oh, Jesus is the one we've been looking for. 
Now, they need to get past the legalism issue, but there's a, there's a clean transition from Judaism to Christianity. There's not so much clean transition from Greek uh, mythology and Greek philosophy uh, as there is from Judaism. So I want to just talk about three um, schools of Greek thought that challenge the church. And so here's the first one. The first one is Gnosticism. Gnosticism is an attempt to define the origin of good and evil. Now I'm giving you a simplistic, there's more to it than that. Um, but it, it really addresses some creation issues. It's very dualistic. It presents God and Satan as being equal opposites. Good and evil, equal opposites, wrong. God is God. Satan is a created being who answers to God, always has, always will. He's not an equal opposite. This sort of uh, thinking is very dangerous because it, A, elevates Satan and lowers God, and B, it separates the physical and the spiritual realms. Gnosticism says the things of the spirit are good and the things of, of the material world are, are bad. And that is not true. And that kind of thinking attacks what we call soteriology. What do we understand about salvation? Let me explain why. The Gnostics, the original Gnostics, they said, well, Jesus could not have been God and man. Because God is spiritual and man is physical, and physical is bad, so God could never have become a man. I got news for you. If Jesus is not God, become a man, we're not saved. He had to be God in order to be worthy to die. He had to be a man to be able to die. He had to be, and he is, the one and only God-man. The Gnostics tried to unravel that by pitting uh, spiritual against um, physical. Physical is not bad. Physical is not bad. We can do bad things physically. We can also do bad things spiritually. But physical uh, is not bad. So the Gnostics, they, they, their first thing, this dualism attacks creation, and then it attacks salvation, and then it even goes into attack some things about lifestyle. Because here's what the Gnostics said. There was kind of two wings of Gnosticism. Remember, it's based on good and evil, or uh, equal opposites, and uh, spiritual and physical are opposed to one another, uh, one's good and one's bad. So they came up with sort of two ways to live based on that. One, you know, what you do in the flesh doesn't matter, so live it up, have a great time, because the flesh is bad and, it, you know, you can't do anything about it anyway, so sin, 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 and you're fine. How many would agree that that's a good idea? Good, no hands, not a good idea. The other one was an equal and opposite. No, they said, they said no, you have to, you, because the flesh is bad, you have to live your whole life to destroy the physical. Not just the sinful flesh as the Bible speaks about our sinful fleshly nature, but you've got to, you've got to harm the body. This is where things came up that you have people beating themselves and kneeling on pebbles and, and doing all sorts of denying themselves food and denying themselves water and living as hermits. There was people living on top of poles for years and just crazy things. And you see, we're doing this for God because we're trying to destroy the flesh. That's not what the Bible is talking about when it says mortify the flesh. It's, it means put to death the sinful deeds of the flesh not get rid of the, uh, of the body itself. There's a lot of other variations on Gnosticism. Uh, one Gnostic leader named Marcion, a very important man in history, uh, he, was a, uh, he was one of these Gnostics. He saw a, a dualistic view of all things, and he decided to put together his own canon of Scripture. That's canon with one N, not with uh, two. Two is the thing that you go pow and shoot with. N is a rule. Literally, canon means the rule. What is the rule by which we decide what books go into the Bible? And we'll be talking more about that much later in our series here. But he put together his own list of the books that should be in the Bible, and they were very, very different from what they are today. And he was a proponent of saying the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are different. I mean, I got a problem with that? Yeah, because there's only one God. And he doesn't change. So it couldn't be that way. I think it's interesting to note that people make a similar, not the, exactly the same, but they make a similar mistake today when some Christians insist on dividing the Old and New Testaments Unne unnecessarily. No, we don't pay attention to the Old Testament. We're New Testament Christians. Look at it. It's one book, and it all goes together. You don't want to get rid of any of it. Paul's uh, strongest writing against Gnosticism is the book of Colossians. Um, but Gnosticism is still sort of alive and, and well today. Uh, you can see it in uh, Star Wars. It's dualism. 
It's, 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 it's Gnosticism. It's strictly what that whole kind of thing is. Um, and of course, what Paul wrote to in the, in the to Colossians was sort of a, an early form of Gnosticism. It was, became more developed later. Another uh, f- sort of philosophy that they had to deal with, it was a heretical philosophy, was Manichaeanism. And we talked about that uh, last time. It's similar to uh, um, Gnosticism in that it's, it's dualistic, good and evil. Um, the leader of the philosophy is Mani, and somehow or other, why didn't they just call it Maniism? But they had to make it longer, so Manichaeanism. Uh, these folks uh, on the Gnostic side, they, they, they favored the asceticism, self-denial. Um, and as history tells us, St. Augustine studied this philosophy for 12 years before he became a Christian. And um, then once he became a Christian, he worked diligently to refute it. Another one, Neoplatonism. Platonism, do you see a person's name in there? Like Plato? Uh, Neoplatonism, Neo just means kind of a retread, a new birth of something. Uh, this was not a new thing. It was going back to Plato, who lived in the 300 and the 400 BCs. Uh, it was rather mystical. Uh, this era taught that there is an absolute being who is transcendent and from whom all that, flow, all that is flows. Again, dualism. It all comes from him. Good and bad are all a part of him. Uh, they further believe that the purpose of existence is to be reunited with the source of all life. So it kind of gets into sort of a, this mystical new age idea that, you know, we're all, you know, swim for the light. You know, we're, we're all going to make it. Um, it's not, again, far removed from new age uh, thinking. A few little theological skirmishes we want to talk about. Besides dealing with uh, the Jewish legalism and the Greek philosophy, um, Montanism and Monarchianism are two incorrect variations on truth, just basic truth. Uh, First, the Montanists, led by a fellow named Montanus, were correctly and, and justly upset with the formalism that was creeping into the church as a hierarchialism was was developing. That's a good thing to, to be concerned about that. They were afraid that the Holy Spirit was being left out. Having begun with a noble interest, like all cults, they took a good thing to a bad extreme. And another thing which is typical of cults, the leader ends up proclaiming himself to be the, the truth. And uh, Montanus did this. He ended up claiming that he was the lone channel through whom the Holy Spirit spoke. Hmm. Uh, common problem, uh, even in cults today. And it's also a common problem with fault finders. Fault finders, pretty soon, they're the only ones left. They're the only right ones. I mean, I've, I've, t- I've talked to people that say, you know, I, I can't go to that church because they don't agree with me about everything. You know, I don't agree with everything in our church. You know, I mean, it's not about me. There's things that people say and do. And, you know, if you're just waiting for it, well, pretty soon, if it's, it's just going to be about you. And that's a, a serious problem. The Montanists were condemned by the, con- the Council of Constantinople in 318. Sadly, not before taking a church father, Tertullian, down with them. He sort of sided with them, uh, as is the case with more radical Pentecostals today. A sincere desire for an experiential living relationship with the Lord above church and hierarchy it ends up doing what? It ends up drifting from Scripture. Why? Because it's about my experience. It's all about experience. The Lord told me. And then you hear these people talking, well, yeah, the Lord told me the other day. He said this, and then they, they just give you this whole dialogue. Like, it's like, you know, if you're talking to God like that, well, you're not. And then he said, then I said, well, Dad. And he said, well, son. No, 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 no. no. Experience versus Scripture. You know, if you, if you have... It is true if you have the Holy Scriptures without the Holy Spirit, you will dry up. But it's also true if you have the Holy Spirit without the Holy Scriptures, you're liable to blow up. And so we have to have both. Another one was uh, the Monarchianists. They erred in their zeal to uphold monotheism. That's a good thing. They, they, they saw the Marcionists saying, oh, there's two gods, the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. And they said, no, there's only one God. So they're trying to champions of monotheism. There's only one God. They ended up rejecting the Trinity. 
This error is also alive and well today. Uni Universalist Unitarians, they, they uh, reject the Trinity. Many cults and isms, they almost always reject the Trinity. Or if they don't reject it outright, they redefine it in an unbiblical way. The Mormons will tell you we believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but the Father is a God who used to be a man who was so good at it, he became a God, and you can become so good at being a man that you can become a God too. And then his son is, according to Mormonism, Jesus is the physical byproduct of a physical sexual union between God, who used to be a man, and a woman named Mary. It's like, no, you're, this is sick. And the Holy Spirit, yeah, we believe in the Holy Spirit, just like we believe in school spirit or the spirit of Christmas. It's, he's just a force or an essence. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they totally mess up the, the, the Trinity, as well as a group called United Pentecostals. Uh, or oneness people. You know, many of these people probably are in those churches who don't really know what's going on, they may even be Christians, but the teaching of the United Pentecostal Church is that there's no Trinity. It's, it's, they say there's one God, and sometimes He's the Father, sometimes He's the Son, sometimes He's the Holy Spirit. Uh, modalism is called, and that's, that's not what we want to be about either. Another interesting sidelight is the fact that these, preacher, these, these teachers of heresies um, they seem to be odd in other ways. Just to highlight on one, Paul of Samosota was a, a proponent of monarchianism. He was a wild showman. Think about this. Think about this today in, in Christianity. Um, he was very, very charismatic preacher. He just he had the people eaten out of his hands. He was a very wild guy. Uh, Ar Arius was a singer. He wrote songs. People loved to listen to his songs. I mean, you know, listen to the stuff that passes as worship in the church today. It's so insipid, so, so much of it. Um, these are the kinds of people then and now. Benny Hinn, you know, Th these are these kinds of cuckoo people. They fit right in of Trinity Broadcasting Network. Oh, you, did you say that on a tape? Yes, because we need to beware of these sorts of things. Lastly, polity became under fire as we're hammering out some of the early problems. Christians seem to have no difficulty finding things to argue about <laughs> and to divide themselves over. And one of the great ones was the Easter controversy. The church was divided over when to celebrate Easter. Really? Really? The Bible doesn't even tell us that we need to celebrate Easter. So we're going to pronounce anathemas on each other about which calendar we follow, about how to... Silly. Another schism uh, concerned Donatism. This was nothing more than a power struggle among church leaders masquerading as a matter of principle. You know, it's like uh, an attorney once told me, he said, you know, when someone says, it's not the money, it's the principle. He said, trust me, it's the money, okay? And when people are fighting, not for money, but for power, and they say, it's not the power, it's the principle. No, it's the power. People don't usually fight for principle like that. Um, Though it was said to be about loyalty and qualifications for eldership, it was really about power and money. So, good news and bad news when it comes to these issues of uh, fables or sound doctrine. The good news, well, first the bad news. The bad news helps the church. Um, <laughs> Well, actually, that's the good news. The bad news is that, it, that there's divisions and people are wrong and there's error constantly coming into the church. The good news on that is that it does force the church to define itself more, more correctly. And um, they should serve as warnings to the church, especially some of these old heresies. They're just retreaded over and over again. As I've mentioned just, just in these last few moments, so many of these old heresies... They're alive and well in the church today with new names, but it's the same things. It's like, folks, this is one of the primary reasons we need to know church history so that we can, we can follow the, the, the triumphs and the good things, the victories that the church has experienced and steer very wide of repeating the same errors over and over again. Well, hope that's helpful.